Thanks, Monty. Uh, how many of you all have ever served in some kind of children's ministry? Okay. That was not near as many hands as I anticipated. So either some of you are lying or you're still not listening. How many of you have served in some kind of children's ministry? Show of hands. Okay, that's closer to what I expected. Now that might be, um, well here we have dots that might be Sunday school, youth group, children's church, VBS, and there's others in there also. Um, some kind of ministry aimed at kids. Um, and I've, I've been involved in several of those uh, throughout the years in different capacities, uh, different age levels, and there have been so many times, uh, so many times I've wanted to communicate some kind of grand revelation that I had. Like, I came across something as I was reading the Bible, I'm like, wow, that's incredible. And I wanted to communicate that to these kids. And I, I, I've been like, you know what, let's just open this up, let's look at this. And I try to show them what I found, and I'm so excited about it. And they're just sitting there staring at me blank, like, what? Y'all ever been there? Have you ever done that? Um, it, it's one of the most frustrating things <laughs> That I've ever experienced because I'm so excited about it, but they just don't seem to get it. Now, to be fair, oftentimes it's not their fault. It's not, right? Um, it's not their fault. Honestly, if it's anybody's fault, it's my fault for not thinking through the material better or trying to communicate it at an age-appropriate level. Um, so, it's actually... Somebody, who said amen? It was you. Okay, that's about right. I'll, I'll talk slower, Alan. <laughs> Everybody says, please. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, anyway, so today in our text, the author runs into something similar to that. He's trying to explain some of this deep revelation, some of these, these really important things, but he runs into this understanding that his audience maybe isn't prepared for some of these things. Um, and almost we almost get a detour in today's text. So if you want to open your Bibles, and I hope you will, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to pick up in verse 11. We're going to go all the way through chapter 6 today. This is a big chunk, but don't worry, we'll go through it pretty quick. Um, but what he runs into is this deep topic, this weighty material. And it does, he acknowledges, it requires some level of maturity to understand this topic, to fully understand this topic. So, Let's stand, let's read God's word together. Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to pick up in verse 11 where we left off last week. Hear the word of the Lord. We have a great deal to say about this, and it is difficult to explain, since you have become too lazy to understand. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness, because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Therefore let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits. For it is impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age, and who, and who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm they are re-crucifying the Son of God and holding Him up to contempt. For the ground that drinks the rain that often falls on it and that produces vegetation useful to those for whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and about to be cursed, at, and at the end will be burned. Even though we are speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case we are confident of things that are better and that pertain to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you demonstrated for his name by serving the saints and by continuing to serve them. Now we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end, so that you won't become lazy, but will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself, I will indeed bless you, and I will greatly multiply you. 
And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and for them a confirming oath ends every dispute. Because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that through two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Thank God for his word. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for your word. Lord, even though oftentimes it is difficult, even though oftentimes we have to strive for understanding Lord, we are thankful that you've given us your word, that you have taught us, that you have revealed to us what it is that you are like and what it is that you expect of us. Lord, today as we, as we look at this, uh, this sometimes difficult text, I pray that you would give us understanding. I pray that you would give us, um, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that want to know you. So, Lord, I pray that you would accomplish that in us and that we might walk away from this time having a better understanding of who you are and how it is that we, too, can grow into maturity, that we might understand the deeper matters of your word. So, Lord, I pray that you would teach us today, that you would direct us, and that, as a result, we might walk more faithfully with you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See... This passage, he begins by explaining the problem that I just spelled out to you a few minutes ago. Um, in verse 11, he says, we have a great deal to say about this. And what he's talking about here is Jesus as this great high priest, the high priest in the order of this guy Melchizedek. And he acknowledges that this is a difficult thing. He says, it is difficult to explain, but why is it difficult? He says, it's not because you are incapable of understanding. He says, it's because you have become too lazy to understand. Um, see, this is not a matter of ability. It's not a matter of ability. It's a matter of the will. Do these people want to understand? Are they putting in the work to understand? See, he says that they become too lazy, not that they can't understand. And he actually kind of calls them out and says, look, at this point, you all ought to be teachers. You should be teaching this, but instead, you basically need somebody to come back and teach you the basic principles. In other words, instead of being a teacher, you need to go back to kindergarten and learn the ABCs. Like, you need the basic principles taught to you again. And he uses a couple of illustrations, not just the elementary things instead of being teachers. He says, you're like babies who need milk. Um, Y'all, I've had babies. Babies need milk. Don't give them solid food. It doesn't go well. Um, That's not experience. Don't worry. Um, But as they grow, they need something more substantial. They need something that will help them to continue to grow. They need solid food. And he says that the solid food is for the mature. He says that these these people who need the solid food, he says that their senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. It's not just that somehow they know this, that that it's innate within them. It's not like it's something that they just come up with. This is something that they have been trained in. And the word for training in uh, training to distinguish between good and evil is actually physical training. This word is kind of like um, not all that long ago we saw the Olympics. You all know that those people train and train and train. One of my favorite quotes was Usain Bolt. Uh, He said he trained four years to run 10 seconds. Um, But you see the incredible physical training that these people put themselves through so that they're able to do what they're supposed to do. In the same way, we need to train ourselves so that we can distinguish between good and evil. It's not going to come to us just by osmosis. It's going to require discipline. It's going to require training. And we are going to have to have the will to grow. It requires a desire to grow. And see, the author, he's, it almost sounds like he's frustrated as he writes this. He says, I can't discuss these deeper matters because some of you aren't putting in the time or the energy or the effort to really understand. You are effectively, you're content being baby Christians. You're okay with that. Um, I'm going to try to contextualize just a little bit. If I was going to say this today, I would say, you know, uh, some of you are content that you have your get out of hell free card, that you have prayed the prayer, and now you're a Christian, so you don't have to grow at all. 
You're good as you are. And that's almost the mentality that you take. Now understand, that's not, gonna, that, that's not it. That's not going to cut it. That's not enough. Because whenever we really know the grace of God in Jesus, there's a desire to grow in that understanding. We should strive after that. There is almost a need to grow to maturity. Now, I'll be honest with you. There have been times in my life where I have been content where I was at. Um, I've just thought, you know, I'm good. And I've even said things like, you know what, I'm okay knowing what I know and knowing that I don't know at all. What that is in itself is a very immature attitude. We should long to grow. Now, we should long to grow to maturity, but what exactly is maturity? I think it's important that we at least define the term, and I'm going to try my best to, uh, to point you back to the text. And as I was stri- trying to come up with an understanding of what is the maturity about which he's talking, what is this maturity, um, I came across a line by R.T. France, and I think, he, I think he defines it well. So here's how he describes this maturity. He says, grown-up Christians, then, are those who have learned through experience to make well-judged moral decisions for themselves instead of needing, like children, to be told what to do. These are, at least in the context of what he's talking about here, it's the ability to distinguish between good and evil. It's the ability to distinguish what is right and what is wrong without somebody holding your hand and saying, hey, you messed that up again. It's our ability to actually say, this is right, this is wrong, to make well-informed, to make well-judged moral decisions for ourselves. Now, if that's what maturity is, according to this passage, how do we get there? How do we actually grow in this maturity? And I think he points them in that direction. Um, it's easy enough because, uh, you all know, I've got five kids. And for us, how do, we know that they're, how do we know they need solid food? Well, they become less and less satisfied with what we're getting, giving them. And they need something that's going to be more substantive, something that's going to hold them over. So that's how we learn with them. Well, it's not as easy here. How do we actually encourage this kind of growth? How do we encourage this kind of maturation within ourselves? And how do we obtain it? And I think as we continue on into chapter 6, what the author does is he says, look, here's what you need if you are going to grow to spiritual maturity. Now, understand, it's not as if you're going to go through these steps and then after, uh, after a three-year course, you're going to finally obtain that mature status. That's not how this works. Instead, we should all continually be growing in maturity. There are some who I've talked to um, who I would consider mature believers, people who have been Christians longer than I've been alive, and they have said, the more I learn, the more I realize I need to grow. Um, this is a lifelong process. It's not going to end whenever you hit this benchmark. Instead, once we get here, actually, then we realize, you know what? I've got a long way to go. So we should constantly be striving for these things. But here's the things that we need for greater spiritual maturity. So let's dive into these. Three things needed for greater spiritual maturity. First, it's going to require a greater understanding. A greater understanding. So chapter 6, as we get here, he explains the problem at the end of chapter 5 and kind of takes this detour now. And in verse 1 he says, Therefore, or since you have this immaturity, because some of you have become too lazy to understand these weightier matters, because of that, he says, look, let's leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to maturity. Let's go beyond this. Now, I'll be honest with you. I read this and I thought, is he saying that we need to just forget these basic principles that we've learned? Do we need to forget the the foundational gospel message? Is that what he's arguing for? Forget salvation by grace. Forget repentance or or that Jesus died in my place. Should we forget that we need to trust in Jesus alone for everything? Is that something we should forget and move beyond? And the answer, of course, is no. Of course we don't forget those things. Instead, those are actually the things that empower us then to move beyond them. They are the foundation that gets laid. We leave the elementary teaching. And here's, here's maybe a way to help you understand this. Now, just like he says, you need somebody to teach you the basic principles again. Um, just think, like, I, not all that long ago, I was teaching a preschooler his ABCs. Um, my, my goal was not for him just to spend the rest of his life learning the ABCs. My aim in teaching him the ABCs was that then eventually he would be able to string those letters together into words and then take those words and turn them into sentences, turn those sentences into paragraphs, and eventually be able to read books. Like, that's the aim. It's for him to grow in that learning. Now, in order to move to sentences and paragraphs and books, does that mean, does that, mean that we need to forget the ABCs? 
Well, of course not. You have to know those so that you can put the words together. You have to have that foundational teaching upon which you then build so that you can grow to greater maturity. And I believe that's what the author is communicating here. We have these foundational principles. We have these basic teachings. Let's build on those and move beyond this foundational teaching so that we can understand the greater and the weightier teachings here. Um, Just so you know, I want to encourage you to never get tired of the gospel. Never get tired of the foundational principles. Um, But what I want you to see is not just how the gospel, well, that means that I'm saved and I'm done now. No, see how the gospel impacts every area of your life. It goes beyond just, okay, well, whenever I die, I go to heaven. It's bigger than that. It's so much more than that. And whenever we take this basic attitude, it misses out on some of the beauty of the gospel. It impacts every area of our lives. So he says, move beyond these elementary, these basic principles. And then at the end of verse 1, he says, not laying again a foundation. Now, what he's saying is there is no other foundation that's needed. We don't need to lay another foundation because we have a good foundation. Paul actually echoes a similar idea over in 1 Corinthians where he says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. He lays the foundation. He is the foundation. He's the thing upon which we build our hope and he's the thing upon which we build our lives. Then after this, he says, we're not going to lay this foundation of, and then he spells out uh, three different pairs of what he thinks are foundational teachings. Um, And I'll admit, some of them are actually a little bit confusing to us, and he considers these foundational. Um, I'll explain what I mean here in just a moment. But these pairs that he lays out, the first one we understand, he says, not laying a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith in God. And I think we would agree with this. This is a foundational principle of the Christian faith, right? Um, How do we come to Jesus? Well, we come to him in faith. Trusting that he is God, that he is everything that we need. And beyond that, then we also know that repentance from dead works is necessary. We know that we need to repent of sin. We need to repent of everything else. This is inseparable from the gospel message. If there is no repentance and there is no faith, it's not the Christian faith. It's certainly not Christianity. There needs to be repentance from dead works and faith in God. So the first pair, I think, is pretty simple. And I think we would mostly agree with that. Repentance of faith, okay. The second one, maybe we get hung up on a little bit. Um, He says, let us not lay again the foundation of uh, of teaching about ritual washings and the laying on of hands. Um, Here's the second pair. And this, to us, seems a little out of place. And honestly, scholars disagree on exactly what is being referenced here. Uh, So I'm not going to say with any certainty. But what seems to be communicated here is that these people have been instructed about Jewish rituals, specifically Jewish washing rituals, and how they then carry over into the Christian faith, or how they can be applied in the Christian faith. And this would certainly include, but not be limited to, baptism. What does this look like? How is this actually practiced? What does this mean? Um, Now, it's not exclusively baptism, but it likely includes it. And these were things about which they had already been taught. Things that maybe were hang-ups for a first-century Jewish audience to say, "How? okay, what about all these rituals? Well, they've been, they've been educated on this already. He says, so let's move beyond these basic principles. And then the third pair he references is the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And again, this is a basic element of the Christian faith. A resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. Um, uh, this week, this week I I, uh, I did a, a funeral service, um, and I'll be honest with you: funeral services sometimes they're easier, sometimes they're harder. Um, especially whenever you know that there are some who are hearing you who have no hope of a resurrection. Um, where all of these folks landed, I, I honestly I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um, but what I do know is that Jesus' resurrection proves the reality of a resurrection. There is a resurrection of the dead. And the Bible unashamedly points out that all in the end will be raised from the dead. Now, just because there is a resurrection for for all does not mean that it's going to end well for all. Instead, Jesus teaches on this fact over in John chapter 5. And here's what he says in verses 28 and 29. He says, Do not be amazed at this, because a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. 
those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. Uh, Unashamedly, we teach that there is a resurrection of the dead. There is a physical, bodily resurrection of the dead. Death is not the end. The grave is not the end. Instead, there is a day coming when the dead will come out of their tombs and they will face the final judgment. Uh, I urge you, I urge you to turn to Jesus so that you might, that you might be counted with those who are given this resurrection of life. There is a resurrection of the dead. And he says this is a foundational principle. This is a foundational thing. And we need to move beyond these things. And then he says in verse 3, he says, and we will do this if God permits. And I find this to be an interesting note as he's moving along through these principles saying we need to move beyond this basic understanding. And he says, we're going to do this if God allows us to do this. Um, we not only come to faith by God's grace, but then we also mature in that faith by God's grace. Uh, just coming to the point of salvation is not the end. Instead, even maturation requires the grace of God, His Spirit working in us. And all of this, he says, is so that we might have a greater understanding of who Jesus is and how He impacts our entire lives. Like, this is what he's urging them towards, right? To have a greater understanding so that they can move beyond these elementary principles. So understand these things. Now, my question for you then would be, are you pursuing this kind of learning? Really striving to move beyond these basic principles, these basic things. Um, I want to urge you not to become content with being a baby Christian. Um, I know a lot of people, who, uh, even Christians, who would say, I'm content to see a convert made. That's not the aim. Converts, while that is great, that is not the aim. That's not our command. That's not our commission. Actually, you look at the Great Commission just on its own. It does, Jesus doesn't say, go therefore and make converts of all nations. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. And then he says, teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. In other words, teach them to mature in their faith. Teach them to grow in that faith. Our aim cannot just be to say, hey, we want a bunch of baby Christians out running around. Instead, our aim needs to be, we want to see baby Christians that then grow into mature Christians. We want to see growth and maturity in people. So if you are content with seeing baby Christians or being a baby Christian, I want to urge you, move towards maturity. Strive for a greater understanding. Um, to put it another way, strive to become a teacher. This is what he says. He says, many of you should be teachers by now, but you've got to go back and learn these basic principles. Strive to learn, so, learn this so that you can not only have a greater understanding in yourself, but so that then you can replicate it and teach others to have the same faith. Like, this should be our aim, is to grow in it and lead others to that same growth. Um, again, it's not all about us, right? It's not all about you. I appreciate that you brought that up this morning. It is about seeing others grow in this grace also. So, greater spiritual maturity requires greater understanding. But it moves beyond that. Greater spiritual maturity requires a greater conformity. A greater conformity. Not only do we understand what has been said and what Jesus has done and who he is, but then we conform to his image and his will. And he begins the next section, beginning in verse 4, with a warning against apostasy, with a warning against falling away. Now he says, in verse 4, he says, For it is impossible to renew to repentance those. Now, I want to ask, as I read this, I say, who are those? Who is it impossible to renew to repentance? And then we get a description here, starting in verse 4. He says, It is impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and powers, and have fallen away. Who have fallen away. Now what seems to be being communicated here is that these are backslidden or apostate Christians. People who have experienced the grace of God in Jesus and then later on rejected it and fallen away. That's what seems to be communicated here. Now, for some of you, you're a little uneasy right now because you were taught much like I was um, in the doctrine of eternal salvation, right? Uh, eternal perseverance, to put it, uh, uh, to put it another way. Um, many of you were taught just like I am. You cannot lose your salvation, right? Um, so for some of you, this might make you feel a little uneasy. But this is what he says, right? Okay. 
Now, I, I want to do a quick lesson on good, good hermeneutical practices. Um, in other words, good Bible study, uh, good Bible interpretation. Um, and one of the first rules that you learn in good, Bible, uh, in good Bible interpretation is to interpret Scripture with Scripture. Bible does not contradict itself, so if you have a part much like this that seems difficult, that you're having a hard time with, use the rest of Scripture to help you understand this part of Scripture. And here's some other passages that teach on a similar topic. For example, I don't, I don't believe I gave you these, Steve, so I'm just going to roll through them quickly. John chapter 10, verses, verse 28, here Jesus is speaking, and he says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Or Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, you are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, there's three different authors in three different places that seem to indicate that once you have salvation, God's going to guard that. It is there until the end. Um, now, there's, that seems to butt up against what the author of Hebrews has said here, so how do we, under, how do we best understand this? What's the best way to do this? Well, I'm going to give you my best understanding, and you can agree with me or disagree with me. I don't really care. Okay. Um, there are two possible options here. Two possible options. Um, one would be that the author is using hypothetical language. Almost like, if a person could do this, it would be impossible to renew them to repentance. If they could actually backslide and somehow lose their faith, it would be possible for them to come to faith again. Or the other is saying that these were people who saw and heard some cool stuff saw the power of God on display, but refused to believe it, refused to believe it, then they would not have another chance. Um, either way, regardless of where you fall here, we find that these are those who hear and fail to conform to the image of God. They fail to conform to the image of Christ. Um, and then verse 6 goes on. Last part of verse 6 says, This is because to their own harm they are re-crucifying the Son of God and holding Him in contempt. Essentially, what's happening here is they spit in the face of God, seeing the salvation that is extended to them, seeing the salvation that's been given to them, knowing the power of who Jesus is, yet spitting in His face. They refuse to submit to Him, saying effectively that they will be their own gods, but they just want Jesus to give them their get-out-of-hell-free card so that they can move on. Um, put another way, I believe that what's happening here is we see these people who are wanting to submit to Jesus as Savior, but not submit to him as Lord. Um, by the way, I, I don't believe that's possible. If you take Jesus, you take Jesus for who he is, not who you would like for him to be, or pick and choose aspects of who Jesus is. He is either Lord and Savior, or he is neither. And in the end, he will show that he's still Lord, even if he's not your Savior. Submit to him. So, we get to verse 7 and 8, and the author then uses an illustration uh, of this, gives an illustration of this from the ground that drinks in the rain, right? This rain is a good blessing from God, and some of the ground produces fruit, some of the ground, it doesn't produce fruit, instead it produces thorns and thistles. It takes the blessing from God, sees it is from God, knows it is from God, but instead it produces things that are worthless, and because of that, in the end, he says it's going to be burned. There is no hope for it. And he uses this illustration. I believe what he's doing is he's drawing on what a first century Jewish audience would have been familiar with from the, from the Torah, from the book of the law, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 where God is, is spelling out the curse. right? And he looks and he says that the ground, this is Genesis three seventeen. he says, The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistle. This cursed ground is not as it's supposed to be. Instead, it's producing something that is worthless. And the problem is that these people received the blessing from God, the blessing of God's revelation, but they failed to reflect it with their lives. They, in other words, they failed to conform to his image, to his expectation. And here what he does, at the end of verse 8, he sets up a, um, a comparison. Sets up this comparison. He says, look, here's those who failed to conform. And then we get to verse 9 and he says, even though we're speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case, 
In other words, you're not like them, so you're different. So in your case, we are confident of things that are better and that pertain to salvation. All right, I'm going to give you a Jared paraphrase here. Um, what he's saying to these people is he goes, look, I know, I know that there are some who have heard and they've rejected it and they've fallen away, but you, you got this. You got this. Despite your shortcomings, you are moving in the right direction. Despite the fact that you, like some of you have become too lazy to understand this deeper insight, you guys have this. You can do it. Keep on going forward. You can understand these difficult matters. So keep on moving. And then in verse 10 he says, For God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you demonstrated for his name by serving the saints and by continuing to serve them. He says, look, your faith is shown through what you do. I think I've said this several times, but um, what you believe will necessarily impact what you do. If you believe something, your actions will follow what you believe. And he says that their love was demonstrated for God, how? By serving the saints. He says that's how their love for God was demonstrated. Um, look, there is lots of ministry out there, and there are a lot of people who rightly, rightly want to reach the lost. Okay, so please don't hear me say we should not go to the lost because that is not what I'm trying to communicate here. Please, go to the lost. Share the good news of Jesus with them. Um, but what we find is that the mark of the church should be a love for one another that is only matched by our devotion to God. It's this love for other believers, for brothers and sisters within the church that should be a defining characteristic of the church. So my question then becomes, how do you, how are you, Christian, how are you serving the saints? In what ways are you using your gifts and your talents, the things that God has blessed you with, in order to love the church, in order to love brothers and sisters? Because that's how he notices them. That's how he knows them. He says it was demonstrated. Your love for God was demonstrated by your serving the saints and continuing to serve them. In other words, their actions have now conformed to their faith. They have conformed to the image of Jesus who loved the church perfectly. Verse 11, he says, Now we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end so that you won't become lazy. And by the way, that word is the same word all the way back in chapter 5, verse 11, um, where he is rebuking them for becoming lazy. He says, so persevere, persevere in this, demonstrate diligence so that you won't become lazy, but will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. In other words, be diligent. Don't give up. Don't become lazy. Continue to persevere. Don't give up on conforming to the image of Christ. Don't give up on it. Um, even as I tell you to conform to this image and follow after Jesus, I don't want you to think that there is some, some way that you have to earn your salvation by doing a certain number of works or do something like that. Instead, our aim is not, is not to pray a prayer so that you are all good, but it's also not to say if you work hard enough or you do enough things and you're also going to be saved. Instead, what we find is that we are saved by God's grace. But that should naturally cause us to grow and to change and to be more like Christ as we live and walk and grow in understanding. So, greater spiritual maturity requires greater understanding and a greater conformity. But then third, spiritual maturity also requires greater reliance. Greater reliance. Verse 13, he says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. And he does this all throughout the Old Testament. Like this comes up again and again. There's countless examples. All through the Old Testament, God swears by himself. He swears by his own name. He swears by his own holiness. All throughout the Old Testament, this is what God does. And that's what we should expect. Because whenever I say, I swear by whatever, which I don't do, by the way. Some of you are thinking, you shouldn't do that. No, I don't. Okay. All right. But whenever you swear by something, you're swearing by a greater authority than yourself. In other words, you're saying, like, there's something at stake here. What does God have to swear by? There is nothing higher than him. Nobody has authority over God. God is the ultimate authority. So there is nothing greater by which he could swear. We shouldn't be surprised by this. And that's kind of the point. He says there is no greater guarantee you could ask for other than God swearing by his own name. 
No greater guarantee. And then he uses this illustration of God's promise to Abraham and confirming it by swearing by himself. He says, so we know it's going to be true. And then in verse 17, it says, because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly to the heirs of the promise, he guaranteed it with an oath. With the purpose that we can hold to his word and his promise so that we can have encouragement and cling to the hope set before us. Now, I want you to track the argument that he's making here. And I'll try to make it as easy as I can here. God swears by himself because there's nothing greater by which he can swear. So he swears by himself with an oath to the heirs. And the heirs would be those who have come by faith to Jesus. Those that Jesus identifies with in his humanity, calls them brothers. So he swears by an oath to, uh, to the heirs of this promise. And this oath is intended to encourage believers and to give them hope. The purpose of his promise of eternal life and salvation is to give us encouragement and hope. The promise is, the promise is this, that through faith and enduring in that faith, we can have life with our God and our King and our High Priest. We can have the life that we were made for. And he confirms it by swearing by a promise, uh, by himself, excuse me. And then verse 19 he says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Um, you all know what an anchor does. And that's the picture he's using here, right? Many of us um, have a tendency to be a little wishy-washy. Um, anybody? Maybe? Maybe some more than others, and you're just a little uncertain. And you're like, well, I have this hope, but then I don't have this hope, and I'm a little unsure. But what does an anchor do? It holds something in place. It's something that fixes you where you are at. And he says, this hope, this hope that is set before us is the very thing that I cling to that holds me fast in this faith. And here, it's the promise that God has made. God's word, God's promise is the anchor that holds us fast, that holds us to Jesus, trusting that his word is true and that we have life and hope through him. It's the thing that causes us to cling to it. And it holds us firm and secure. In verse 19, he says, it enters the sanctuary behind the curtain. Enters the sanctuary behind the curtain. Verse 20, Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner. Remember, who is the one that entered or uh, who, who went through the heavens, who went through the curtain, who went beyond it? Who is the one that did that? Jesus is. Jesus is. In other words, is our anchor. He is the promise. He is our forerunner. He is our hope. He is everything. He is the very thing that guarantees that we can have eternal life. He is also the one that gives us hope of a future. He is our anchor, and he's gone there to prove that it's possible. He's the one that went through to make way for us. Because he entered God's presence, we have hope that we too can be restored to our God. And all of this, he now returns to his argument in verse 20. The last part of verse 20, he says, All of this is because Jesus has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. All right. Some of you are thinking, I still don't know who this Melchizedek dude is. See you next week. Um, we're going to talk about him a lot next week, so just stay tuned. All right. But what I want you to see today is that all of this, all of this requires us to rely on Jesus. If we want to grow in maturity, it forces us to rely on Jesus. He is our anchor. He is our forerunner. He is our hope. He is our future. If we want to grow and become more mature so that we can understand the greater, or the greater, that's not a word, the greater or the weightier, I mix two words. Y'all ever do that? Okay. If we want to understand those things, it forces us to rely more on Jesus. We have to rely on him for this greater understanding and this greater conformity. So what? My question then becomes this. How are you growing and maturing? How are you maturing? Or are you the one that has become lazy? Is this rebuke written to you? Are you sitting back assuming that you've got it made so that you don't need to learn or grow? Or, you know what, I've punched my ticket. I've got my get out of hell free card. I'm good to go. Like, I don't need to worry about the rest because I've already got this. I, I, effectively, I can live like hell if I want to. It doesn't really matter because I've got my ticket punched. Like, is that you? If so, I want to urge you, don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. 
Move beyond the basic principles. Move beyond them. You need to learn and grow. Don't just go through the motions, and maybe this is you. Maybe some of you go through the basic motions. You show up to church on a Sunday morning. You read your Bibles every once in a while. Every, you sometimes say a token prayer, but you never really strive to grow in an understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done and then conform to it in obedience. Maybe that's you. Um, don't let that be you. Instead, pick up the word, go to a Bible study, meet with another Christian, start a reading plan with a friend, do something, come to Sunday school, work toward a greater understanding of who God is, who Jesus is, and what he requires of us. Like, grow in your understanding. But then don't just stop there. Like, I don't just want you to pick up a bunch of head knowledge so that you can win an argument later on. That's great, good for you. I'm happy that you can win an argument. Don't stop there then strive to obey what you've learned. Conform to it. Don't just get the knowledge, but apply it. And do what God's word expects. Um, one of the verses, I told you that uh, I did a funeral this week, and one of the verses that stuck with me was 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 8 says this. For the training of the body has limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds a promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And I think many of us know the first part of that, right? Training of the body has, we know it has benefit. We know it has benefit. Um, I know very well some of you watch what you eat. You are careful about what you put into your body. And some of you are like, not me. Um, some of you do a really good job of that. And some of you may even work out. You, you strive to train your body. Um, I, I, I've told people, I, I, obviously there's benefit to training your body. I watch, uh, the Chiefs are 4-0, and you all are excited about watching them tomorrow. The Royals are in the postseason. I'm excited about watching them. These are a bunch of young men who have trained their bodies. And we see the benefit. We see how that plays out. We see their abilities because they have trained their bodies. But you notice that little caveat there. Training of the body has limited benefit. Good for you. You train your body. That's excellent. That's good. It has a benefit. But, but it's bigger than that. We should train ourselves in godliness because it's beneficial in every way. Not just in this life. Like, and certainly there is benefit to training ourselves in godliness in this life. I remember hearing one preacher say, um, if you want to be good at life, read the Bible and do what it says. If you, want to be a, if you want to be good at life, read the Bible, do what it says. Even if you're not convinced that it's all true, read the Bible, do what it says, you're going to be good at life. It has benefit for this life, but it's bigger than that because it has a benefit for the life to come. Eternal benefit. Why? Because it holds a promise for the present life and for the life to come. So train yourself in godliness. Understand who Jesus is and then strive to conform to that. Um, but one last word of caution before I end my time. One last word of caution. This does not all come by your own efforts. It does not come through striving, or you know what, if you pick yourself up by your bootstrap, certainly you have things for which you are responsible, and you need to take action and do certain things. But really, this growth comes as you rely more and more on Jesus. This is the reliance we need. We need to rely on him. Maturity only comes if the Lord permits. If God permits, that's all the way back up in chapter 6, verse 3. We can grow to this maturity if God permits. We need him if we're going to grow. And by the way, this is why prayer, which I hammered on pretty hard last week, this is why it is indispensable from our growth. It's necessary. You can strive all you want, but let your striving be to cling to the anchor who has entered God's presence on your behalf. Let your striving be to be more and more like Jesus, to trust him more. So go often to God, go fervently to God, and go boldly to God, and let him be your strength, let him be your hope, and let him be the means by which you persevere. All of this so that we can grow in greater and greater maturity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for our forerunner. We thank you for our anchor and for our hope. Lord, we are grateful that you've made a good promise that as we come to you in faith and repentance that we too can have eternal life and we can be counted as heirs. So Lord, we thank you for that promise. I pray now that as we strive to understand the weightier matters of the Christian faith, Lord, I pray that you would show us that it requires us to grow in understanding and conformity, and it requires us to rely on you more and more. So, Father, turn us towards you. Let us see Jesus clearly. 
trust him all the more as we see the age to come approaching. Uh, Lord, we need you. Teach us to rely on you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.